Before we correct our motivation, which is another um, aspect of things that Buddhists do before they receive any teachings, I first want to say thank you so much to Kim and also to Jeannie. Um, to Jeannie especially for requesting these teachings and also to Kim and Jeannie for having such open hearts and opening their home to us. Um, this is really a paradise. I mean, when we were here uh, for five days practicing Guru Yoga together with our teacher, this room, we practiced together, we chanted together, and um, after that retreat, I just started to see Ely as this paradise, <laughs> as this um, sacred circle. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about sacred circles in this practice today, because Tara's mandala, one of the meanings of mandala is a circle. And so when we enter into the practice, in some ways we're entering together into a paradise, into a sacred circle. So um, right now we're going to correct our motivation. And one thing I'll ask you to do is lessen a little bit your um, solid ideas about you know, this space, about who you are, and just open your heart up and, and imagine yourself entering into a place of great perfection, a place of great beauty, um, which is really your heart. So we're going to correct our motivation right now, but know that we're kind of at this point formally entering the mandala of Tara. So um, please take a moment and reflect on your aspirations for this retreat. Think about why you came here. I'm thinking about why I'm teaching this. And at this point, I'm thinking also on the inside that I'm teaching to um, give the gift of Tara and to really um, not think about myself so much as a teacher, but think about myself as really a, a channel to um, allow the wonderful beauty of Tara, the mother, to, to just come in and so that we can spend some time with our heart energy, with our mother energy. So please. Um, correct your motivation, and I ask you to join me in thinking, may our retreat increase our capacity to be the embodiment of enlightened loving kindness for all sentient beings whom we encounter in our journey in life. This is the essence of bodhicitta, which is, bodhicitta translates at the, as the mind of enlightenment. Bodhi is enlightenment, and citta is mind. Whenever I talk about mind, um, you need to know that my teacher touches his heart. So for Tibetan Buddhists, and maybe for many other people, and even, even maybe for you, we oftentimes think of the mind as located in our brain. And the mind in Buddhism is really, the, um, really something that's profound. It's like the, it is the cycle of life. It's our whole being. And so when he talks about the mind, he touches his heart. And so today when I talk about the mind, please think about your heart center if that's a place that you, if you can relate with the word heart better than mind, please hear that. So please cultivate the essence of bodhicitta, the essence of the enlightenment mind that expresses itself as compassionate activity. So we have, um, we cultivate enlightenment, and we're talking about enlightenment, but the expression of that among all of us is compassionate, loving um, activity, is the expression of that. So it's not just something that we think about, it's something we feel, and that feeling that we have naturally radiates out and naturally, spontaneously, you know, helps us pick up that person who has just fallen. And so that's the Bodhi mind. That's the enlightened mind. It's not just a thought. It's that reaching out spontaneously to help people. And all of us have that. All of us have spontaneously performed compassionate activity without, any think, without even thinking about that. But what we do in Buddhism is we cultivate that consciously so that more and more of those spontaneous activities flow out of us until we're, we're not even thinking about it. We're not even picking and choosing the people we want to help. We just start helping in any way we can. So please correct your motivation and think about that. Ask that this retreat help you increase your compassionate activity in the world. So another part that is traditional of Buddhist retreats is at the end of the retreat, we're going to dedicate all of the positive energy that we've generated through practicing, and we're going to give it away. We're going to give it to the world. So just so you know that right now, you can think about the people for whom you're practicing. It can be like you know your family, your friends, your coworkers, 
animals. It could be the energy on this planet in a sense to balancing the energies right now on this planet, extending generosity to all people on this planet so everyone has enough. You can recall that to mind and know that at the end of the retreat, any of the practice that you've done, we're going to be sending that energy out formally to all people. We're going to be giving it up and recognizing that, that we are all really in a sacred circle together on a vast scale. So that is correcting our motivation. And at this point, we've arrived at the start of our teachings. And in some way, we've arisen as bodhisattvas, as these great heroic beings who decide to take on the task of helping other beings very consciously. And they take on that task in an unlimited fashion. They just expand their minds and expand their hearts and say, I will be the cause for happiness in this world. And again, we're circling back to the four immeasurables that we prayed. We're thinking about, I will be the cause of happiness. I will be the cause for joy. I will be the cause for reducing suffering. And I will practice that with equanimity. I will try to really do that in an equal fashion for whomever I encounter. So that is the start of our retreat. And it's also entering Tara's mandala because that is her commitment as a bodhisattva. That's her commitment as a Buddha. And a little bit later in the retreat, I'll talk about the origins of Tara, of, of how she came to be the mother of all Buddhas, you know, how she came to express herself in Christianity as, as the Virgin Mary, and how she expresses herself in so many other ways as the mother energy on this planet. A little bit about our retreat structure. Um, the retreat is going to be in four sessions. And in each session, I'll be doing some teachings, and then we'll do guided meditation together. We'll practice Tara together. We're going to keep on circling around many of the same concepts. Many of the concepts that I just introduced are going to be coming back. So if you haven't practiced um, Tara before, just relax, let go. You'll have a chance for questions. And as I said before, Part of Buddhism is, is trying to sit down as often as you can in a really repeated way. Because if you've ever like learned an instrument or learned how to knit or any, anything, you know that with repetition, your experience of it deepens and, and your ability to, to you know, express yourself in painting or in knitting expands. So Buddhist practice or, or any type of, of centering prayer has the same uh, effect on you. It, it just keeps on expanding and widening. So just so you know, we'll, you're going to, to have opportunities to keep on circling around this. So relax, enjoy the practice. This is a very joyful, gentle practice. Um, and it's also a really loving way, especially if you know someone who's suffering and you're concerned about them. It's a really loving way of of feeling like you can help them and send some positive, loving energy to them. So as I said, I've been practicing White Tara for six years or so. My practice has come and gone. But um, recently, uh, my teacher has asked me to start formally teaching this. And I'm really grateful for it because I love this practice. I love, love sharing it. And you know, really, it's humbling to me uh, over six years, you know, how long it's taken me to really allow my heart to, you know, peek out from behind a locked door, which recently when I was writing these teachings, George Harrison's song came out, and he has a great song about that, you know, asking someone to please allow your heart to peek out from a, from a locked door. But I think one of the um, amazing powers that this practice has is to... Um, allow us to feel connected in the world, to have that heart energy open up. And the more we feel connected, the safer we feel in this world, and the more we can open ourselves out and start peeking out. Um, and as soon as we do that, we start seeing Tara. We start meeting Tara everyone, everywhere. And we start seeing that light shine out from people's eyes, and we start recognizing people as Tara. And we were at um, Temperance River State Park when we came up here. And I saw a man with the most 
amazing, astounding beard I've ever seen <laughs> in my life. And I'm a little bit of a person that I, my, my niece and nephew, they're of that generation right now in the 20s where beards are really back. And I'm sure in Ely, you guys experience a lot of really good beards, but his was magnificent. So I went up to him and I just said, can I take a picture of you? <laughs> and I think that he's gotten this before because he kind of got a smile on his face and he said, sure. And so what I noticed about him first from a distance is this amazing beard. But when I got closer to him, he had the most beautiful eyes and the most loving, gentle um, spirit about him. And it was coming out. And so I was really glad to make a connection with him because um, I don't know how to explain it. When you see somebody who has eyes like that, it's like they're giving a gift to you. So that, again, for me, is one of these aspects of Tara practice is that and meditation in general is that what it does is it opens you up, it allows you to, to reach out to people, and then suddenly you really receive back the gifts of making connection. And also what it does is it allows you to settle down your mind enough and open up your heart enough that you actually will, will notice these details of beautiful blue eyes. And and this is the more vivid, vivid, vivid encounter that you have with the world. And, and this is a beautiful aspect of meditation and of centering yourself and of calming yourself down. So know that that is something that has really developed in my practice and I'm really grateful for it now. And, and it's really allowing me to have a larger, vivid experience of life, which of course is there all the time, but I was you know, missing out a lot on it before. So, as I said before, um, the energy of Tara is really a gentle practice, and it's really about embracing and opening up. And one of the things that white Tara practice does is the reason it's a healing practice is, is that the more that we can embrace what is, the more that we can, we can show up and be compassionate or have a skillful action in that moment. And so, also what it does is it reduces fear. Tara is called the liberator. That's one of her names, and it's, she's the liberator from fear. And ultimately, White Tara is constantly kind of pointing out to us very gently that if we avoid what is, if we are rejecting what is arising in our life or what's arising in other people's life, that is that closed door of the heart, it won't allow us at that point to accept things like suffering in our life. We'll, we won't have enough courage or enough, uh, yeah, I think courage is the right word, to show up for suffering. And it also, at the same time, if we can't show up for suffering, we can't show up for joy. So what we really realize in Buddhism is that joy and suffering are just two sides of the same coin. And in fact, they're not even two sides. The only reason we know what joy is, is because we've experienced suffering. And so this relationship is really what allows us to know. And on a basic level, if you think even about language, if you didn't know, uh, for example, um, if you didn't know in some ways what the taste of sugar was like, you didn't know that experience, you couldn't then understand later what the taste of bitter is like. But you can't really also explain what the taste of sugar is like just using words. And so the most direct, the most effective way of, of teaching someone what the taste of sugar is, is putting a sugar cube or honey or something in their mouth, and then they go, aha, they experience it, they know it. And so then they also have an experience, and then when they say sugar, they can, you know, they can say it, they can speak in a little bit with a way that, that they have that experience behind it. But for example, when I say sugar, I have no idea what image of sugar just popped into your head. It might have been like that brown, rough and ready, you know, sugar that's in the co-ops, whatever that really rough sugar is. It might be that completely refined cane sugar, the very white one. Uh, it might be... Uh, maybe when you thought of sugar, you thought of honey. So one of the things about our relationship to life 
is that we may be using the same words, but we never know what other people's experience and their perceptions are. So one thing that also happens in meditation is we become a bit more inquisitive about realizing we want to understand other people's perceptions and how they see the world. But also we realize that our experience of this world is completely based on our own experiences and perception. And this is one of the big opening things in Buddhism is because, or probably in any wisdom tradition, is that you start realizing that what you know is based on your experiences and then you realize that we have to have compassion because so often our connections with people are coming out of a place of really not knowing where they're coming from. And so this is another thing that white Tara practice does is by opening our hearts, and especially meditation, by helping us sit and realize also, we get to learn what our perceptions are. And by understanding what our perceptions are, then at the same time we realize that we're all together, but we're all having individual experiences of this world and, and our life. And one of the non-dual perspectives is not different, not the same, which means we're not different. Ultimately, we're all part of this sacred circle, but we're also not the same. We're having our individual experiences of it. So when you think of the Virgin Mary or of White Tara or of the mother, you're all going to have different experiences of that energy and of her. And I may not even know what form she's arising in your mind. When I say the mother, you might be, you're probably all getting different views of that. So one of the things that you need to know is that energy arises in endless forms. In endless cultures, different forms of the mother arise. And that's also one of the joys is that Tara um, lessens our attachment to things having to be a certain way, to the life, the world having to be a certain way. So that's an introduction to Tara practice. And at this point, I would like to um, tell you a little bit about the origin of Tara, and then I'd like us to actually um, practice together. We started about 15 minutes late, and I hope that you'll give me an extra 15 minutes. So we're just going to have to shift at this point, because I want us to practice. But at the same time, I want to talk about the origin of Tara. So. Just as I talked about the fact that we all have creation stories or we all have um, stories where we explain how we see the world, this is the, these are two stories connected with how Tara arose in Buddhism. But know that there are many, many different stories about how compassion was born. So there are many stories of the origin of Tara. And it is said that the Buddha of Compassion, whose name is Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit and Chen Resik in um, Tibetan, and you need to know that um, Tibetans feel very much like His Holiness the Dalai Lama is the Buddha of Compassion embodied in a human form. And um, I heard Robert Thurman say this one time and it really struck me. He said, imagine what it would feel like if we thought that the highest form of compassion was continually embodying with us lifetime after lifetime, you know, imagine if we really thought, for example, that, that, that Jesus, for example, had decided that one lifetime wasn't enough. He just wanted to keep on coming back and helping all of his followers over and over again. And that's how Tibetans feel about His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and that's also feel how they feel about their teachers, that these people have had connections with them, and lifetime after lifetime they're coming back to help them. Same thing with Tara. The mother comes back again and again. We all have mothers. So in some ways, um, when you're listening to the origin of Tara, also realize that Tara is taking embodied form over and over again. It's, it's all the different forms of loving kindness. So Chen Resig, and we have a picture of, of Tanka, of, of the Buddha of compassion over here. And you need to know that he has like a thousand eyes. He looks like a peacock in some way. He's got a thousand arms going around. And each of these, of his hands has an eye on it. And this symbolizes that his compassion is so great that he wants to be able to see the suffering and the um, 
any life circumstances of everyone. So that's why he has a bunch of eyes. And that's why he has a thousand arms. It's to symbolize this great reaching out. Because one of the most powerful things that we do, for example, is literally our hands symbolize our ability to reach out. And so today we're going to be talking about these hands that have eyes on them. Because Tara, the form that she takes, um, she has eyes on her palm of her hand, on this palm of her hand. She's got one here, two here, one here. Um, and she also has eyes on the soles of her feet. And, and there's wonderful teachings on each of those eyes. But I, I will just want to point out to you that the Buddha of compassion that we're talking about is depicted on that tanka. And you can go up later during a break and take a closer look at him. So it is said that the Buddha of compassion of Alokiteshvara or Chen Resig had spent countless <coughs> eons fulfilling his bodhisattva vow to liberate all beings from suffering. And he thought that his work had been completed. <coughs> but when he looked again, he saw that the endless wheel of suffering was continuing to spin. And so he, re he just wept tears of love and compassion. And from his left eye, out of a tear, was born the female bodhisattva, the female Buddha, White Tara. And out of his right eye, out of a tear, was born the female bodhisattva, Green Tara. And there's a picture of both um, White Tara to the left of the Green Tara statue here. You also have her in your folder. And then there's also a, a picture of Green Tara. And mm -hmm. They said to him, don't worry, we'll help you. And so compassion is one of those things that the more you practice it, the more it multiplies. I mean, it just becomes a stronger and stronger force in your life. So his tears, his, his tears of love and compassion, out of those tears, out of his really his heart feeling, the feminine energy of compassion arose. And Green Tara is known as the swift one. Green is related to the color of air in Buddhism. And, you know, it's just like it's air is everywhere, right? It's, it's the breath of life. And so she's the swift one. Whenever you need her, just breathe in and she's there. She can help calm you and help comfort you. In fact, she's, you know, fueling us, you know, right now. That's prana. That's, that's this chi as... You know, Rebecca, being a, a, a teacher of energy, knows so well. So Green Tara is the known as the swift one who comes to our aid when we call on her and helps us with any matter that we need. And you need to know that, that Green Tara, the mother energy, makes no distinction between mundane matters or between spiritual matters. So if you don't feel like washing your dishes and you need some extra help, <laughs> Breathe in, you can re recite the Tara mantra, Om Tari Tu Tari Tu Re Soha, and just go at it. Do those dishes. <laughs> and Tibetans do that. They, um, Tibetan, if you've, I've, I've been with a friend of mine named Alma Lama who owns the store at Tibet Arts. I told her a story of, of suffering that I had just heard about one of my friends who was suffering, and she immediately started reciting Om Tari Tu Tari Tu Re Soha. It was just like a, a a natural response, meaning that she was calling immediately on aid for this person that I was talking about. And that really moved me. But they also chant this mantra when they um, cook, when they walk, you know, many different ways. So again, it's, it's lessening these boundaries between the everyday and the sacred and the profound and really bringing them together. Um, White Tara, the practice that we're going to be doing is known for um, her healing activities, for extending long life, and bestowing also ultimate realization or enlightenment. So those are the two Taras. But you need to know that Tara, like, for example, you learned from Kajra Rinpoche, a red Tara practice. There's blue Tara practices, green Tara practices, yellow Tara practices. So she comes in rainbow colors. And any of her emanations or any of the energies that she has ultimately are the same. There's one Tara energy, there's one mother energy, there's one energy of loving kindness, but it manifests in different ways. 
And the reason she has different colors is because um, in Tibetan Buddhism, like also in um, Chinese medicine, they have what are called the five elements, um, space, air, fire, water, and earth. And each of those different elements has a different color associated with it. And so Tara having different colors is also symbolic that subtle energy and also um, outward energy, the form that takes place, is just all different configurations of rainbow energy. And so that's also one of the things that you know, you need to know. One more story and then we'll practice. Another story of Tara's origin is that many eons ago, a princess named Yeshe Dawa, Yeshe in Tibetan means wisdom, Dawa means moon, um, so the moon of primordial wisdom or wisdom moon, generated great compassion and vowed to become an enlightened being. She vowed to become a Buddha, which is having unlimited compassion, a being who says, I will activate my full potential as a human being, to be unlimited compassion in action. And she vowed to do this as a woman, to demonstrate compassion for women, and also to show that women are as equally capable of this as men. So His Holiness the Dalai Lama playfully refers to Tara as the first women's liver. <laughs> because one of her names is Liberator. So one of, she has many names, but one of her is Tara, um, the swift one, the remover of fear, and she's called the Liberator. Because what liberates us is, is, um, is letting go of fear, ultimately. So Yeshe Dawa was told that she could only obtain enlightenment in a male form. But she skillfully taught her detractors that on the ultimate level, the wisdom of enlightenment is neither male nor female. In fact, it has no ultimate form. It is pure potential of loving kindness. And she taught them that the wisdom of enlightenment is the absolute, open, spacious nature of the mind. And so they called her, her detractors called her the Great Mother because her realization of the ultimate nature of enlightenment birthed their own realization and birthed their own enlightenment. So she's called the Great Mother because her, when you learn about her realization in you as the Great Mother of Wisdom, your own enlightenment is birthed. And that can take place over and over and over again every day, moment by moment, when you have those aha experiences and suddenly you understand something. That's your wisdom. That's your compassion coming. So just know that as the Great Mother, you know, in Buddhism we say enlightenment is already present. It's, we already have Buddha nature. We already have ultimate wisdom. We're just in a process of uncovering it and remembering it. So, you know, the Great Mother wisdom is birthing us all the time anew. Every day, the sun rises, we're new people every day. And thinking about that is actually a great, great, great source of, of encouragement because it means that every day we have this opportunity to learn more about our wisdom and to express it as compassionate activity every day. So our Tara nature is this absolute open spaciousness of the nature of mind. And another metaphor for wisdom is called the skylight nature of the mind. And the reason that we talk about the skylight nature of the mind, and again, you need to think about mind, the skylight nature of the heart, if that is what you resonate more with, is because the sky is always there. It's always there. Sometimes it's covered by clouds of delusion. Sometimes it's covered by such thick clouds of thoughts. You know, sometimes it's covered with thick clouds of suffering. But this open sky-like nature, this wisdom, this enlightenment is always there. And in fact, the clouds and the sky aren't really separate. It just appears that things are moving in front of it, but they're always, they're always together, of course. Without sky, you couldn't have clouds. So again, it's always these, you know, back and forth, back and forth, non-dual perspective. So that sky-like vast emptiness 
allows Tara, our wisdom, our enlightenment, to arise in whatever form it needs to take on. Because think about it, without this open space, um, nothing would be able to actually be present. I mean, if, if there wasn't, in some ways, open space around my hand, and also open space in a sense of, of um, lack of some permanent fixed uh, situation or state, I wouldn't be able to move my hand, literally. So we're constantly flowing. We are constantly expressing this rainbow energy all the time. And so ultimately, we don't have any inherent fixed um, identity. We have no inherent fixed energy. And if you really, really look carefully, you can't find a fixed aspect of your body. But we have that perception of it. Of course, I need to have the confidence that I can move my arm, that the bell is here, and that this can ring. But man, I can't even uh, really parse that out or separate all that out. I mean, the thought of doing that, the action of doing it, and the sound reaching you, it's just like, it's, it, where, where are you going to stop and start that whole action? So that is the ever-changing energy of our life, and that's Tara. Another aspect of Tara is she has a form where she's dancing. In fact, she's dancing constantly. It's called the dance of life. Um, in Hinduism, or I don't know why I looked at you, but, <laughs> but some of you I've, I know have studied Hinduism, that is Nataraj. Mm -hmm. Do you know the, the ring of flames? And it's the, it is um, Nataraj, who's the lord of the dance, and he is constantly dancing the dance of life. In Buddhism, there are uh, Dakinis, the, again, the feminine skygoers, the female skygoers, who are dancers and flyers. And so there's also that kind of realization that we're, when we're talking about this constantly rainbow energy taking on different configurations, we're looking at, at the dance of life. So she has another form like that. OK, it's 10 o'clock. Give me 15 more minutes, then we'll have tea and banana bread, because I want to have some too. But we're going we're gonna to practice Tara. And we're going to practice this time swiftly just by reading through the ritual text, the sadhana together. We're not going to have time to do all the visualizations, but I want you to become familiar, at least to have an experience of it right away in the session before we move on to the next one. Um, the Tara text should be in one of these folders that has the bigger flowers on it. Tara is beautiful. She is the most radiantly beautiful feminine form you can imagine. There's a picture of here of her in here. Um, Right now, I'd like to just ask you, when you're practicing, to, to have an image of radiant light that has this really embracing, loving energy. So just feel that, that light right now. And then as we practice, we'll, we'll learn more about her form. So this is the piece of paper you're looking for. It has a picture of Tara in the corner of it. And it starts out with the words refuge. and We'll say this three times. And like I said, just relax, go through it, and we'll just practice. And then in the next three sessions, we're going to go more in depth to each of the sections. So refuge three times. I and all sentient beings take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, Tara, and her mandala. I and all sentient beings take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, Tara, and her mandala. I and all sentient beings take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, Tara, and her mandala. Generating bodhicitta three times for the benefit of all sentient beings in order to obtain the state of perfection, I shall practice the sadhana of Tara. For the benefit of all sentient beings in order to obtain the state of perfection, I shall practice the sadhana of Tara. For the benefit of all sentient beings, in order to obtain the state of perfection, I shall practice the sadhana of Tara. Prayer of the Four Boundless Qualities, three times. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. 
May they never be apart from the sublime bliss that is free from suffering. May they remain in a state of equanimity, free from attachment and aversion to those near and far. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be apart from the sublime bliss that is free from suffering. May they remain in a state of equanimity, free from attachment and aversion to those near and far. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be apart from the sublime bliss that is free from suffering. And may they remain in a state of equanimity, free from attachment and aversion to those near and far. Front generation of White Tara. Om Maha Shunyata Janavajra Sobhava Atma Ko Hang. In the space before me appears a white lotus with the moon disk upon it. The love and compassion of all the enlightened beings appear from this as noble wish-fulfilling Tara. She sits on a lotus and moon cushion, a luminous moon halo at her back, Youthful and radiant, her right hand gestures in an invitation to liberation. Her left hand, holding an upala flower, indicates the protection of the three jewels, giving courage and assurance to those dominated by fear. Mantra recitation, longevity practice, and healing activities. And at this point, just bring briefly to mind anyone for whom you have the intention of practicing. You can practice for yourself. And also a pra uh, imagine that this light that we're at this point in the space of White Tara and her mandala is going to be radiating out. So just bring that to mind for a moment. OK, please recite with me, starting at brilliant light. Brilliant light radiates from the syllable tam within her heart collecting back the essence of inexhaustible vitality and powerful blessings of body, speech, and mind. Energy streams forth from Tara's heart and body. I and all beings absorb this nectar of light and are cleansed and revitalized, obtaining the realization of deathlessness. We'll recite the mantra three times together. Om Tare Tutare Ture Soha. Om Tare Tutare Ture Soha. Om Tare Tutare Ture Soha. Long life mantra also three times. Om Tare Tutare Ture Mama Ayer Jana Punye Pitong Kudare Soha. Om Tare Tutare Ture Mama Ayer Jana Punye Pitong Kudare Soha. Om Tare Tutare Ture. Mama Ayer, Jana, Punye, Pitong, Kurie, Soha. We'll recite Tara's prayer three times in English. The Tibetan is above it, but we'll practice in English today. Illustrious Tara, please be aware of me. Remove my obstacles. Quickly grant my excellent aspirations. Illustrious Tara, please be aware of me. Remove my obstacles, quickly grant my excellent aspirations. Illustrious Tara, please be aware of me. Remove my obstacles, quickly grant my excellent aspirations. At this point, we'll do the session conclusion. At this point, just briefly imagine this white light, this rainbow light is dissolving into all phenomenal appearances, so everything. This white light, all phenomenal appearances, then dissolve into light and they dissolve into Noble Tara. And then Noble Tara dissolves into your heart center and protects you. And I'm doing this because I always imagine this light entering the, my crown chakra and just filling up completely my body from head to toe. And at this point also, you would want to also imagine this light, if you're practicing for someone, especially if they're sick, you also want to imagine all of this light also entering that person's body and, and really visualizing them as glowing with vitality. So let's um, 
recite together, starting with all phenomenal appearances. All phenomenal appearances become the mandala of noble Tara. Everything dissolves into light and dissolves into noble Tara. Noble Tara dissolves into my heart center and protects me. We'll offer the seven limb prayer. I bow down in body, speech, and mind. I present offerings both actually arranged and mentally created. I purify all diluted actions. I rejoice in all pure activities. I request you to remain until total enlightenment. I request your wise and compassionate guidance. I dedicate my merit for the benefit of all beings. Dedication of merit. By this virtuous practice, quickly attain the realization of noble Tara. Accomplishing this, may I liberate all sentient beings without exception into the same realization. We'll do the closing prayers and the last prayer we'll recite three times. May I attain in each and every life the sublime virtues of existence and peace. May I pursue the flawless mindset of altruism, working for the welfare of others on a vast scale. Through this very merit of mine, may every single sentient being eliminate all forms of negativity and practice virtue forevermore. May supreme precious bodhicitta take birth where it has not arisen, where it has arisen, may it never wane, but continue to grow forevermore. May supreme precious bodhicitta take birth where it has not arisen, where it has arisen, may it never wane, but continue to grow forevermore. May supreme precious bodhicitta take birth where it has not arisen, where it has arisen, may it never wane, but continue to grow forevermore.